This is the hog commodity meeting at the 1982 National Convention of the National Farmers Organization in Louisville, Kentucky. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the 1982 National Convention and especially a very warm welcome here to our hog meeting this morning. And Keith, if I can get you to lower the lights there in the back for us just a moment. Uh, this morning, first off, my name is Merle Sunken, the director of the Hug Division for the National Farmers. Uh, this morning I will be covering about six or seven points that I think as I and you as hog producers need to be looking at, and I'm going to be covering very, very lightly some of the uh, steps that in just a few moments uh, Larry Sills here, uh, my assistant and the head negotiator for the uh, hog division at your home office, will be going through the details of some of the things that I'll be covering this morning and going into step by step some of the things that your organization has put together, you as producers have put together for the membership and for yourselves and made possible better programs throughout the uh, areas and regions in which we're at. But I think there is one thing that we always have to look at and we never want to get away from, and that is simply the structure of this organization or the structure of the hug division. As we look here this morning, and I've said many times, and if you were in the uh, convention last year, you probably heard me go through this very same overlay. It might be a new overlay, but the situation and the people and the producers are the most important people that we have throughout this organization. And I don't want, it's not for you to never forget that. That overlay is for me. It's for Merle Sunken, where I never forget that you are the most important people that this organization has. And because without the production and without the producers, this organization doesn't have anything. And I just want to make myself and Larry Sills up here this morning well aware of who the most important people are. And the organization, of course, then we have the county meat committees. The county meat committees are, again, some of the most important people that this organization and that I and Larry have as we work together with various programs. Then the next group of people is your collection point and your collection point meet committees, which may be around the collection points. Now that collection point meet committee is not necessarily the meet committee that is in the membership agreement. What we have asked, and for the last couple of three years, uh, the collection point meet committee is nothing more than normally the chairman of the meat committees from the counties surrounding that particular collection point. Because most collection points have anywhere from two to three or four or five different counties coming into that particular collection point. So we have asked for a little bit quicker communications, and let's face it, there are some counties out there that uh, aren't very well structured uh, as far as committees are concerned, so we have asked a collection point meet committee to help us out for faster communications with our programs around the collection points, but normally the collection point committee is nothing more than an arm of your county committees as your membership agreement states. Of course then, the next group of people, you have your collection point itself and the collection point board and I hear daily a very, uh, well, let's just say we have some confusion once in a while between the collection point board of the collection point and the meat committees surrounding that particular collection point. And a very distinct difference, as I would like to put it this morning, is the fact that the collection point board is nothing more than the people that are in charge of the monies that is paid for rent at that collection point because many of our collection points are leased 
from possibly a sale barn has been we've leased or the producer around the collection point has leased it. Uh, possibly the producer around that collection point has bought the collection point itself and they have a collection point board to govern the facility itself. So that is a facility board. It's not the meat committees here. Their responsibilities are only the monies that is paid into for rent and the disbursements and the maintenance and, and care of that collection point. These people here, the responsibility is working with that producer to get his volume going through that collection point as your membership agreement states. Down here, of course, is the commissioned people that work at your collection point. You have a custodian, which is uh, a man or a woman that is responsible for the monies that are paid out to the producers up here for the livestock in which come through the collection point, no matter whether it be hogs, cattle, sheep, or whatever it may be. The collection point manager over here is the uh, another commission purpose person which takes care of the livestock, the physical livestock itself, and helps put it to through to the packer in which it is designed to go to. Down here we have area supervisors in different areas. We have cattle reps, we have uh, feeder reps in the feeder cattle department, we have sheep representatives, we have area supervisors here in all the departments and also in the hog division we have uh, area representatives. We do call them regional supervisors in the hog division. Down here you have your four department heads, uh, director of the hog division, myself, uh, Andy Nutzling is the director of the fat cattle division, uh, Gary Ellis for feeder cattle, and Dick Hammond for the sheep division. Of course down here then you have your meat department director, uh, which is Walt Hackney, which is a link to all of us people with the total organization meeting the total structure for the uh, livestock department. The second point I would like to cover this morning is how did the hog producers or why didn't the hog producers in the United States grow in numbers last year? I believe most of you that was at the convention last year, if I recall right, we had approximately all oh, maybe 38, 39, 41 dollar hogs a year ago today, somewhere in that category depending upon what state you were in. If you was out in Portland, Oregon, you probably had like 42 or 3, Ohio probably had 41 or 2. Uh, I was probably down to $38 level. Why didn't the numbers grow? Because we all was told and I probably even made a statement last year that the hog numbers might grow so you want to lock your production in on a cost of production plus a reasonable profit on forward sales. Well ladies and gentlemen I still think that was the best thing that could have ever happened to this organization. and because we do have the facts and the figures and Larry Sills here will be going through them here with you later this morning. I think this here describes what happened to the hog numbers in 1982, what happened and why the hog numbers in 1982 didn't grow. It was simply because the producer went into the lending associations throughout the country and when he came out he had been told that his financial flow, his cash flow would not work for that particular hog operation and he went home without any monies borrowed because if you can recall in the past 12 months we've talked about anywhere from 16 to 22 to 24 percent interest at a lot of our lending institutions and with the hog markets that we've had in the past year there was no way that a man could go in and set up a total confinement operation or buy feeder pigs for 
Uh, well, we've seen them as high as $70 this year for a 40-pound pig. Your cash flow wouldn't work for you. Even though the furrow to finish operation has been working, it has been working all year of 1982, and we will show you the facts and figures here a little later on this morning to back up and to show exactly step by step where this comes from. The next thing I would like to bring to our attention this morning is how do we producers stay ahead of the fast changing industry that we have out there today? And what I'd like to relate to that is that you and I as hog producers just think for just a moment how you produced hogs on your own operations some 10 years ago. Think of the vast amount of things that you have changed as far as your veterinarians and your medicines, your breeding stock. Are you still using the same breeding stock that possibly your father had on that farm? Are you using the same breeding stock that we read in the newspapers a uh, short few years ago. I think if you'll go down to the hog booth, and I don't know how many of you walked past it yesterday or this morning, uh, we took some pictures of just different hogs, and I'm certainly not saying one hog is any better than the other ones, but I think down there, and I gathered those pictures up, and Larry here and myself has put them together uh, throughout the last year, and all those hogs that are on those pictures down there come from the champions, every hog on that are his champions from the Austin Hormel National Barrel Show that Morrell and Company sponsors up in Austin, Minnesota every year. They are National Barrel Show and every hog on that picture is national champions. And look at the difference of them. And uh, hopefully we can bring that up to date a little bit more because we've had several suggestions and, and uh, comments on it. Look at the difference in the housing that you have had in the past one year or the past 10 years especially in your housing. You know, I, I see Mr. Shelp and I'm going to start picking on him a little bit this morning because he started it when he walked into the meeting this morning. But I've been personally on Bob's farm in the last couple of years and I know that Bob has really changed his operation the way he's raising hogs today and the way he was raising hogs some short four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years ago. So we have did many things. You know, in the operation that I personally had myself raising hogs several years ago, I had nothing more than a triangle building, a three-sided building with a big feedlots out in front that held several hundred head of hogs. Uh, we see very few of those today. Most of them are in total confinement operations today, uh, the mass majority of the hogs. So we have changed, but what haven't we changed? We still want to sell price and not profit. We still want to use the liquidation programs that have been available to us as producers for many, many years. Last year, you heard Larry Sills stand right here on this podium and tell you that there was farm organizations setting up marketing programs, and they are running into the same resistance that this organization ran into many, many, many years ago. They're experiencing the same thing. The national pork producers, which I probably, and I'm, I'm bragging just a hair bit, but I probably know as much about the national pork producers as many, many, many of their own members. I've worked very closely with the national pork producers for the last five consecutive years. We've been to their national conventions. We go to their home office. We visit back and forth. We had one of their representatives uh, in our home office just this last week and presented their new programs to us. Uh, I want to keep up to date on what's going on, anything in the hog industry. I see many, many changes. Uh, you know, even the McRib, uh, finally we're getting pork into the uh, 
fast food chains in this country. So, yeah, you bet. And it's been a good deal, you know. And I have to give the national pork producers a lot of credit for that. I really do. If you boil the national pork producers down to two words, you're going to have to call it promotion and research. If you were to boil the National Farmers Organization program down to two words, it's got to be marketing and bargaining. And why should we as pork producers and growers of hogs out here argue about that? There's no argument to it. The National Pork Producers did set up a task force. I was in the very first meeting where that was, took place. The disheartening thing to me is that that committee, that task force today, does not have a marketing program tied to it and it does not have a representative on it that is for collective bargaining. And that disappoints me. So the people that give me a round of applause, you can take that home with you and ask for marketing people on programs because they have to work together. I'm not promoting, I'm not discouraging. I'm saying we as hog producers do not have to be tore apart by different organizations. But there is not a better program in this nation, and I will prove it to you before you leave this room, than what you have available to you and a National Farmers Organizations program. And I'm going to prove it to you before you leave this room by facts, by figures, and by accuracy. And I want you to challenge Larry Sills and his, not, not as he's giving his presentation possibly, but when he is through, if you have any comments on any of the facts or any of the figures or any of the remarks that are made from this podium today, I want you to challenge them because that is my challenge to you to find this morning or any other day a better program that has been totally put together than what it has been for you as hog producers in this organization. Now that's not bragging. I'm not saying a thing for Larry Sills or myself. It's just the opportunities that the people in this organization, the hog producers, and I'm talking about you, you people have given us the opportunity in 1982 to do some things in this organization that has never been tried nor done before. And within the next few weeks, uh, I'm going to let Larry tell you, but I'm, I'm going to drop it right there. But Larry's got a little surprise for you this morning. And I'm so daggone proud of it. I want to about like Devon Woodland was last night, you know. Uh, I just wanted to go up there and help Devon, and I like to throw a million bucks out on the stage last night when Devon was giving his presentation up there and said, you know, this is the first million, there's some more coming on. Well, we don't know that for a fact, and I'm sure he didn't last night as he was giving his presentation. And just like the program that Larry is going to be presenting to you here in a few moments, we don't have it. I don't want to give you any false hope, and Devon didn't want to last night, I'm positive. But I'll tell you what, this organization is on the threshold of making some large advancements unless some major thing happens that we and the home office and the leaders of this organization don't know about. And that I'm mighty, mighty proud of. And I'm going to give a lot of that credit to Walt Hackney, the director of the Livestock Division. Uh, I know he gets a little bit rough once in a while and, and so on and so forth, but I also know that he forces myself and he forces Larry Sills through me to do the best job available. But our jobs cannot be done without your production and without your help. The National Farmers Organization have written contracts. Let me show you two examples that I brought with me this morning, and I'm going to have to read them and explain them just a moment because you won't be able to understand them uh, because I did not bring the entire contracts with me. I have two examples here with me this morning, and one of them was with a packing company that was written, a contract that was written in this organization in 1975. 
That is the pricing formulation that was written in 1975 on a supply contract. The base price shall be the top of the bulk range one to three mid-station quote in Interior Iowa as quoted at by the USDA at 10.45 a.m. plus 80 cents per hundredweight delivered to the respective plants. Hogs delivered under this contract grade USDA ones and twos and threes but in no event may any day's shipment contain more than 25 percent USDA number three hogs. In 1982, now the one that what I want you to remember out of this ladies and gentlemen is we had the practical top of a market plus 80 cents per hundred weight delivered to that plant. In 1982 we wrote another contract with exactly the same packing company and it reads like this, the live base price at the collection point uh, for butcher hogs shall be the East Missouri mid session practical top of the one to twos, 210, 240 pounds with weight with up to $1 per hundred weight for quality. Packer do be to pay NFO Incorporated Corning, Iowa, 40 cents per hundred weight for services uh, rendered, i.e., trucking arrangements and scheduling. Freight from the NFO collection point shall be paid by the packing plant. We use the same top market, plus we put a buck on it for quality, plus we put 40 cents on it for services, plus we made the packer pay the entire amount of trucking. And are you running more hogs in your collection point today than what you did in 1975? I don't want you to shout out that answer. I want you to think about it. That's what your negotiators, that's what Larry Sills is doing for you as hog producers. And if you want to challenge any of the things that's being presented to you this morning, I welcome them. Because I hear time and time and time again that you people at the home office are setting on your cans and not negotiating for hogs. I'm not saying that I'm protecting Larry. I'm only saying the programs that have been set up and available for you as hog producers. And I've not even touched on the good ones that he's going to use here in just a few moments. I want to show you now why that some of these things have come about this year. You know, last year I stood at the convention and I told you that we put a block of hogs together on the eastern part of Iowa that started a new era. Well, you heard Walt Hackney say in his presentation yesterday afternoon that there's no new era out here. You people thought of it 26 years ago. We are now implementing the things that have been talked about in this organization for many years, and that is blocking hogs together, contracting them, delivering them, you know. These are some of the things we're talking about. Let me show you an example here. We drew a picture of the state of Iowa, and I hope it looks like Iowa. Those are four collection points over on the eastern part of Iowa where this new program that's 26 years old started out. That is four collection points. This is Farley, Greeley, Amber, and Cascade collection points. What did we do? Well, we kind of blocked the state up a little bit, didn't we? So we cut it in four pieces, representing a block. And when you're in other meetings today, this could be, you know, a geographical block of a state. It could be your hog houses. But what I'm representing here is a block of production. As we flip this over and see it this way, you will see that we went into a small geographical area of the state of Iowa in four collection points because there are over 20 collection points in the state of Iowa. But we went into a very small area and put a block of hogs together and started a program of contractual arrangements for producers 
and the only difference between the contracts or arrangements that I just showed you with this particular company and I read to you, the difference is, and the only difference is, are you producers are also committed under contract for delivery. That's the only difference. The bargaining power is not in the block itself or the inventory. Sure, it's, that's where it starts. But the real guts of the whole program and this organization, no matter what commodity you're talking about, is a fact that it is in delivery. It's not in the things that you do. It's not in the negotiations. It's not in the, all the presentations that we make. It's in your delivery of that product. That's when the nuts and bolts are all scrambled together and put together and new programs are put forth with more money tied in it where you can have a better cash flow for your operations. That's where it comes from. It comes in the delivery of those hogs, in your performance and our performance as an organization. And believe me, it is coming together. There's two meetings I would like to have you to attend, if none other. And of course, I'm a little bit partial, as you might have detected. And I'm mighty, mighty proud of this organization. Carol Olive, Dan Goff, and Roger Slotik is holding a collection point meeting just out of this back doors and to your left, or as I mean, yeah, to your left as you walk out the door, then room 218 and 219. I'd like for you to attend, if at all possible. Also, this afternoon, we will have Carol Kylo Heinemann in from the CFTC, which is Commodity Futures Trading Commission from Washington, D.C. And he has asked this organization to be a part of his sounding board, and he is on the board the five-man board of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And he wants this organization because we do have, and he probably won't say it to you because he cannot, but I want you people to know that you have the finest forward contracting program for producers that's recognized in the United States. I want you to know that. Heinholt commodities have been recognized for the best for the best speculating contracts in the United States for speculations. And I want you to know that you've been recognized for the best forward contracting program with the best there is to be had at this time. So at this point I'm going to turn the meeting over to my assistant Larry Sills, which hails from the state of South Dakota. After schooling, he went to the South Dakota State. After graduating from South Dakota State, he went into sales. He went in working with Wilson Foods, Wilson Packing Company and Wilson Foods. After spending some time with them, he came with the National Farmers Organization as a regional supervisor for the state of South Dakota in livestock and cattle and hogs. His father worked 25 years of his life for Hormel Packing Company. And I am mighty proud to have Larry Sills on my staff. And he has a very fine program. I'm going to turn the program over to him. And I want you to take your pencils and papers out, and if you need a little bit more light in the back, I want you to turn on a little bit more light there on the left-hand side, Keith. People take notes. After this meeting is over, come to our booth tomorrow or in the afternoon late and ask Larry Sills anything or myself or any of our staff that's here. Ask him anything that you want to about his program because he has the finest one for producers 
anywhere in the United States, and I want you to remember that because he does have. Thank you. Larry. <laughs> Thank you, Merle. He got my college right this year. Last year he told the people that I was from the University of South Dakota, and uh, that's like the University of Indiana and Purdue. You don't get those things goofed up in the state of South Dakota. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is my second uh, convention with the National Farmers Organization. Uh, last year in Indianapolis, I get, I get very nervous before I get up in front of people and it's just something that, that happens to me. But I came to the convention last year and Merle told the people that, you know, I came down and he had a big old stack of pancakes on his plate and some eggs and some sausage and I came down and had a glass of orange juice. Uh, I want you to know that that this year I just had coffee. <laughs> I didn't know whether I could stand the pulp in the orange juice. I think I finally come to realize just how damned important this organization is. There comes a flash on the newswire through the home office, and it says food is still cheap. One of the very few things that since 1976 that has not kept pace with inflation. Now, I don't know whether someone in Washington wants a gold star, but I will guarantee you it will not come from us. I want to go through some programs today that I think with your help, I know with your help, will change the cheap food policy in this country, put some money back in the countryside where we all know very well that money must come to turn this thing around. Merle has talked briefly about block contracting. I want to do go through it, uh, I hope, in a little more detail. And first of all, I'm going to go to that state of Iowa that Merle talked about. Let's turn it off. Let's talk first. Let's talk about why we went to the eastern part of Iowa. It's very, very important. Number one, uh, late in the fall of 1981, there, there was a situation that happened in eastern Iowa where we lost three major pork processing plants. We lost Oscar Meyer in Davenport, Iowa. We lost Wilson and Company in Des Moines. And then we lost Dubuque Pack in Dubuque, Iowa. We lost the capacity to kill almost 20,000 hogs. It put, a, it put a glut on the market. The membership from the eastern, portion, eastern part of Iowa came to us and said, something needs to be done. We think we can do, and Merle has told you what this organization talked about 26 years ago. Let's put them together on a block committed totally, without question, that they will be delivered and bargained for. That was done. The problem was that there had been such a glut created in the eastern part of Iowa that not very doggone many people were interested. How many? One. The hogs were put together in numbers. I'm going to tell you 125,000. There may have been 150. 
Initially, I was not involved in the first block. But the block was put together. It was negotiated for. There was one interested party. The bid was taken back to the participants of the block. And I say that because not all of the people that participated were members at that time. It was ratified and brought back, and the first block was on the move. And it took seven days for something to happen that we thought would happen. Before the block was put together, we had an eastern and a western market, which had never happened before. And the prices may not be perfect, but the western part of Iowa compared to the eastern part of Iowa was a difference of a half a dollar. Seven days, and they were the same. And it has not changed back. With less than 150,000 head of hogs in a particular area, we created a vacuum. They were no longer available for someone to come and purchase. It is exactly what collective bargaining is supposed to do. I want to show you what the people in eastern Iowa made up in their area to tell their story. Negotiations for the contract brought the people an additional 50 cents over the previous market that they'd sold on. In addition to that, we raised the basis in their area 50 cents. So in fact, through collective bargaining, we had raised the market in eastern Iowa $1. We were successful. And a producer called Merle Sunken in an afternoon from the state of Wisconsin and said, Merle, there are a group of us in the state of Wisconsin that would like to put an additional 10,000 hogs on your successful Iowa block. And Merle said, no. Do it yourself. You will be successful. And they were. And I'm talking about the producers, not the national office, not the staff people in the area, because there were none. I'm talking about the producers in the southwestern portion of Wisconsin put their block together. Prior to the block in Wisconsin, Wisconsin ran about a half a dollar behind the Iowa market because, in fact, there, were, there was one market available, really. The block was put together, it was negotiated for, and yes, there was more interest. The first block was successful. The block was taken and sold to a packer who gave us the best program, which, uh, you know, you have to talk about price. But you also have to talk about the different options that are available in that packing house, which include forward contracting options. Can I contract for every month? What size contracts can we let? Those things were very important. The block was sold, and in fact, the net, we'd done better. And this one only took two days. All of a sudden, USDA found 
and recognized the state of Wisconsin and quoted a Wisconsin market which I'd never seen before. Two days and the market was quoted at the top side of the Iowa market. Our block had raised the basis 50 cents. Our negotiations had raised the market on the, on the number one and two hogs by an additional 50 cents. And we had negotiated an additional 15 cent services, which in fact were taking back to the producers a dollar 15 additional money. It was successful, and it was successful because the people in Wisconsin wanted it to be successful. Now, what happens in an area when a block is put together? It's functional. Do you think the rest of the buyers in the area are going to set back and let your price go by them and be a half a dollar over them? No, they're not going to. You know they're not going to because collective bargaining does work. And they must come up and raise their price and become competitive or they will die. And they do. And a very prime example And I'm using this because it's close. It was in the state of Indiana. There are many outlets for hogs down here, and I don't know whether I can put them all, and I'm going to, uh, don't worry about the location, but there are many. That's probably not even enough. The block was put together down here around Ireland, Indiana. And they put together some 100,000 hogs. And they raised the market through collective bargaining. And these people out here that are procuring the hogs for other facets of our industry had to raise their market too. We all knew it would happen. That's what exactly what we wanted to happen. But when you do that, farmers seem to have very, very short memories and farmers are not the only people. They forget what it once was. And they know only what it is today. Merle showed you a part of what a negotiated contract was for in 1975. He showed you a contract and told you I was responsible, I was part responsible, along with Merle Sunken. We've changed a lot. A lot of good things happen. Uh, we, we all tend to forget. We let it go by. We say we take it for granted the things we have. And I am not telling you that we don't need more and better things. Because I know we do. There was no opportunity for the people in this area, in Indiana, to buy their hogs then at the Indiana market minus a half a dollar delivered, which in fact they were doing before this block was put together. The Evansville market, which is not that far away, was in fact the Indiana market. And the packers, especially one particular packer on the western side, knew that because there was a marketing expense at the Evansville stockyards that he could lower the price enough so that in fact the people would be about a break even to deliver to him. He couldn't do it anymore. And we raised the market. 
Now it's all functional. The blocks are all going. But we're not done. We cannot allow the blocks to die. We have to, in an area, keep interest. We have to talk about our block. We are successful. If you do not tell your successes, who's going to tell them? Remember that, that lots of people have short memories. They first.